İkinci konuşmacımız Sayın Adonis Hicaz, e, Case Western Üniversitesi'den. E, bize yaşlıda noktere konusunda bilgi verecek. E, teşekkürler. Thank you very much. Let me just move this. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first, I want to start by congratulating Turkey on your 100 years uh, celebration. You guys have a beautiful country and beautiful people, so thank you for having me being here with you guys today. Um, I'm, I'm tasked to talk about Nocturia and elderly. So Nocturia in 2002 was defined by the ICS as the need to void one or more times during sleep with each void preceded or followed by sleep. But not all nocturia are symptomatic. Studies have shown that when nocturia is more than two times, it becomes associated with serious consequences to the patient and bothersome to the patient. What is the impact of nocturia? As you well know, it, it, it's associated with a reduced health-related quality of life, mood disturbance, especially uh, um, that, <coughs> uh, the stress, depression, reduced productivity at work, poorer overall health, and people sometimes say that it can impact the pathophysiology of health, hypertension, diabetes, increased falls and fracture, in addition to the financial consequence of falls management. Uh, epidemiologically, in a big study by uh, uh, Bosch and Wise, uh, reviewing the 43 epidemiological studies, it has shown that nocturia and the uh, men in the age of 20 or 40 was around 2 to 17 percent and women in the age of 20 to 40 it was 4 to 18 percent and the prevalence goes up with age so and the men and women in their 70s to 80s it goes up to 79 to 59 percent and 28 to 62 percent now this is a busy slide but i want you to focus on the uh, uh, uh this side of the slide if in order to evaluate nocturia um, uh, all the, the, if you conceptually think about it as four categories, then it would be easy to link, uh, do the differential. So there is low bladder capacity as an etiology for nocturia, where the uh, maximum voided volume is around 200, or low nocturnal bladder capacity, where the indicated by the nocturnal bladder capacity less than 200. The second category is polyuria. The patient produces a lot of urine, indicated by 24-hour urine volume, more than 40 cc's per kilogram. In a person who is 70 kilograms, it's around more than 2.8 liters of urine production. The third entity is nocturnal polyuria, and this is defined by the nocturnal polyuria index of more than 0.33% uh, age adjusted. Now, and there is a mixed etiology, a combination of the three above. Now, what is nocturnal polyuria? And nocturnal polyuria was defined by the ICS as uh, in the patient who have normal 24-hour urine production, it's usually nocturnal polyuria is defined when the nocturnal polyuria index is more than 0.33. Uh, another definition, there are mother, multiple other definitions, but one of the uh, commonly adapted also a definition is nocturnal urine production or urine output more than 90 cc's per hour. So obviously, as physicians who care for patients with nocturia, you have to take history about fluid consumption, alcohol, caffeine, urinary symptoms, and that's what we do as urologists. Sleeping habits, sometimes it's outside our comfort zone, but we, we should start asking about sleeping habits in patients who come with nocturia. Um, general medical history, obviously you want to ask about diabetes, congestive heart failure, chronic renal insufficiency, hypertension, and it's important to review what are the medication that can impact nocturia, like calcium channel blockers, diuretics, and lithium. <clears throat> now, before I present this algorithm that was developed by WISE, how many of you guys uh, do a voiding diary on your patients when you see them or with nocturia? That's, that's great. And this is why it's what I expect in a group of people who are specialized. When I ask my general urology group, who do a lots, of, lots of oncology and, and other types of reconstruction, um, the amount of people who obtain a voiding frequency chart is uh, way less than this. But essentially, uh, central to the diagnosis of nocturia is obtain a, to obtain a frequency volume chart. 
And based on the frequency volume chart, you can uh, develop this uh, four category of diagnosis. So low bladder capacity, nocturnal polyuria, uh, polyuria, and mixed in uh, etiology. And when you make a diagnosis of low bladder capacity, then that's, this is urological disorders, and you follow, this is what we do best. We evaluate BPH, overactive bladder, and we treat them. In nocturnal polyuria, that's when we go outside our comfort zone. So if we diagnose nocturnal polyuria, personally, I send my patients to a sleep study, and I refer them to sleep medicine, because there is evidence that if you treat them, they will improve. Obviously, we communicate it to the primary care physicians so that they evaluate them for congestive heart failure, for diabetes, and uh, we may want to make sure that they don't have peripheral edema. Now, if the patient has polyuria, more than uh, 40, kilo, uh, 40 cc's per kilogram, then you, you want to know what is the underlying cause. So uh, it, it is, I, and here I, personally, I don't, do this myself, but I send the patient to a nephrologist, let the nephrologist manage this. So they will do an overnight dep uh, water deprivation test, and if there was uh, a good concentration of urine with overnight water deprivation test, then most likely this is primary polydipsia. If the patient could not concentrate the urine with overnight uh, water deprivation test, then you think about a renal uh, concentration capacity test. So if the A patient has normal renin concentration, so most likely the problem is central, like central diabetes insipidus, and if they have an abnormal renal concentration per capacity, then the problem is in the nephrogenic level, whether it is chronic renal failure or lithium or other medication intake. And mixed is a mix of all. So I think this is a nice algorithm, nice slide to keep it in... Uh, uh, in, in your practice. There are other ways to look at nocturia. This is another way to present nocturia, but um, I'm not going to bother you with this, but essentially it allows you to look into how to treat the different etiology of nocturia. Central, it seems to me from reviewing this literature and from my practice, central to the management of nocturia is behavioral lifestyle changes, and we'll talk more about it. And then you address the underlying etiology based on your evaluation algorithm that you saw above. Now, lifestyle and behavior modification include minimizing fluid intake at least two hours before bed, particularly caffeine and alcohol, restricting total fluid intake to less than two liters per day, emptying the bladder before going to bed. Uh, this is an important point, barrier-free access to toilet or toilet chair. And this is essentially to decrease the risk of uh, falls and fracture. Um, increasing the uh, exercise and fitness level, reducing dietary salt, uh, weight loss is overweight and obese. And for patients with peripheral edema, we ask them to elevate the legs uh, above the heart level before going to bed. And for patients who are on diuretics, we typically, in my practice, I tell them to take the diuretics uh, mid-afternoon rather than uh, prior to retiring. And you have to also factor the half-life of these medications, whether it is uh, furosemide that they're taking or uh, torosemide, because they have different half-lives. Now, there is evidence that shows that multi-component lifestyle modification has an impact. This is a Japanese trial looking at a different intervention, including fluid restriction, uh, refraining from excess hours in bed, moderate uh, daily exercise, keeping a warm bed. That had shown that there is a reduction in the mean nocturnal voids from 3.6 to 2.7, and the decrease in mean nocturnal urine volume from 923 to 768 after four weeks. Another study uh, with 82 patients with nocturnal polyuria, 30 minutes of education and behavior modification, regulation of fluid intake, and regular meeting with a uh, nurse practitioner. These authors show that there is a decrease uh, in nocturial events from 2.6 to 1.1 at the end of the study. So uh, it seems, and this is what we adapt in our practice, that a multi-component intervention is effective in reducing the nocturia events. Now, diuretics are also part of the treatment. It's counterintuitive because diuretics can cause nocturia, but the aim of the diuretics is to shift the diuresis, I, I call it forced diuresis, before sleep, and shift polyuric phase from the nighttime to the daytime. And this approach might be suitable in your practice for patients with nocturia when the underlying cause is unknown. And patients with nocturnal polyuria as a result of reabsorption of lower extremity uh, um, edema 
uh, would benefit from a mid-afternoon release uh, or using a diuretic. Um, how, how do we treat and reduce uh, nocturnal bladder capacity? I, uh, I, I will now follow up. Uh, um, Jose did a great job uh, over, uh, giving you an overview on medication in the elderly. So obviously all medications can be used, especially if you document that there is decreased uh, nocturnal bladder capacity. However, most of the studies have shown that the margin of improvement is very minimal, although it's statistically significant, but it's minimal, 0.2 episodes compared to placebo. And obviously Botox is another thing that we can offer patients who have nocturia refractory to medications. Now, there is strong evidence, as I told you, to the impact of uh, management of sleep apnea with a CPAP. This is a study from patients who have mo moderate to severe um, sleep apnea managed with uh, a CPAP machine, and there was a significant decrease in the nocturia event in both the mild and the moderate with the treatment. Now, <clears throat> uh, the last end, uh, the, uh, modality of management we'll talk about is the antidiuretics, desmopressin. Uh, desmopressin is a synthetic uh, vasopressin analog that acts on the V2 receptor in the distal uh, collecting uh, tubules of the kidney. It allows the kidney to concentrate the urine at night. Uh, that desmopressin has been shown to be efficacious and well tolerated for patients with nocturia and nocturnal polyuria. Uh, with females having uh, lower effective dose compared to males because they are sensitive to hyponatremia. There are different formulations. In the United States now we have the melts, uh, the uh, nocturna we use. Uh, the sublingual melts formulation has a time to maximum plasma concentration of half an hour to two hours and a serum half-life are around 2.8 hours. Now, desmopressin 25 milli microgram uh, once daily compared to placebo in 261 women uh, with nocturia voids more than two per night have uh, been shown uh, to improve on the uh, nocturnal events and the delay uh, the nocturnal void by 49 minutes compared to placebo. And similar effect has been demonstrated in men with 50 to 70 half microgram of desmopressin. Um, no, hyponatremia is, a, a, is definitely a risk and a concern. Uh, we typically check for hyponatremia, uh, for sodium level before we initiate the med treatment, one week after and one month after and periodically after that. For the concern, hyponatremia occurs in 5 to 7 percent and there are risk factors for hyponatremia. Elderly patient, patient with low sodium, uh, serum sodium concentration at baseline and higher 24 uh, urine uh, volume production and in women. Uh, symptoms of hyponatremia, obviously we're urologists, we're, uh, but we have to keep an eye on this. Usually it is the decrease, uh, associated with decreased sodium level, nausea, vomiting, headache, lethargy, and in rare cases, confusion, decreased consciousness, and muscle weakness, spasm, cramps, and seizure, and God forbid, coma. Now, um, this concludes essentially my, my uh, uh, over, overview on how to manage uh, in Nocturia and the elderly. I just want to give you a quick overview on a study that we did with the primary care uh, physicians at our institution. Just to tell you this, where ideal situation is and what's reality. It's an interesting finding. So we haven't published the study, but we surveyed physicians that work with our institution. We surveyed primary care physicians, obstetricians, and stuff like that. We asked them a number of questions about their practice pattern, what they do when they see a patient with nocturia. And we had a good response rate of 175 surveys we sent out. We had 67 responses. For a survey study, 38% response rate is pretty decent. When we asked them about how much fluid they recommend to their patients, it was all over the map. So 16% um, said they will tell the patients to drink four glasses of water, 25% six, 30% eight glasses of water, and 22% will tell them to quench their thirst. Just make no recommendation whatsoever, but just quench your thirst and drink according to thirst. And the majority of the respondents, 87%, will adjust their recommendation based on the medical condition of the patient, if the patient has congestive heart failure or something like that. <clears throat> Most primary care physicians will evaluate nocturia and, noctun, uh, and polyuria patient for UTI and diabetes, and that's what they do most. 15% will evaluate them for congestive heart failure, and none will screen for sleep apnea. This is an important finding, and it's like this is 
interesting that among all these practitioners, none will even screen for uh, uh, sleep apnea, let alone do a diary. So excessive uh, caffeine or fluid intake, incontinence, and timing of diuretic medication has been used commonly by these physicians. Uh, a lot of the physicians will initiate behavioral therapy, 75%, but they, they were not clear on what they will initiate. 10% will start the medication. When the patient comes and tells them, I have nocturia, here you go, take this pill. 25% will simply refer, and most commonly to urology or gynecology. And if you are a gynecologist, your chances are that you refer more than if you are a primary care physician. And most manage nocturia as a urological rather than a medical disease, which is an important finding. And there is no set algorithm for the diagnosis and management of nocturia and polyuria among the primary care physician. And there is differences among specialties. So despite the development of the algorithms that we follow as urologists, that doesn't carry over to the primary care physicians. And something is happening. We're not probably doing a good job in educating them. And I agree with Jose that collaborating with the primary care physicians is an extremely important task that we have on our shoulders to help our patients uh, improve on their care of nocturia. Um, finally, I would like to thank these two guys. Alker was my co-fellow when I was at the Cleveland Clinic uh, back in the days, over 20 years ago. And Ali uh, joined us last uh, year for a year uh, with our research team. And this is how it started for me coming here. But since I've been here, I've met a number of amazing people uh, that I hopefully will call friends in the future. So thank you guys for having me. It has been a pleasure. Adonis, çok teşekkür ederiz. Bu geniş kapsamlı e, nokturi konusundaki bilgiler için e, soru sormak isteyen varsa alalım. E, çok güzel konuşma için teşekkür ederiz. E, konuşmanızda da e, zaten bahsettiniz ama tekrar bir sormak istiyorum. Doğru ve e, en iyi tedavi vermek için nokturi konusunda mesane günlüğü ee, olmazsa olmaz mıdır? Yani mesane günlüğü e, doldurmadığımız bir hastada doğru tedavi, doğru nokturi tedavi vermek imkansızdır. Ee, sizce doğru bir cümle midir? I 100% agree with you. 100%. And I, if I didn't stress it enough, I want to highlight it again. Uh, having a diary is central to the diagnosis of nocturia. And uh, the whole algorithm that I showed you is really based on the diary evaluation and interpretation. So I, whenever I see my patients in my clinic uh, with lower urinary tract symptoms, whether it's nocturia, overactive bladder, or any lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, we have um, uh, on discharge, we give a printed diary to the patient and we give them hats actually and a bag so that they can and I'll, I'll have my nurse go in and explain to the patient how to do the diary. Because I think it's instrumental for us to understand what's going on. So I agree with you 100%. Uh, Adonis, uh, this hasta group is actually the most important thing to do with the patient. This is the most important thing to do with the patient. This is the most important thing to do with bir eğitim veriyor musunuz? Bunu nasıl gerçekleştiriyorsunuz? Neler söylemek lazım? So I think we're not doing a great job educating the uh, uh, the caregiver. And let me tell you, uh, if I if I'm allowed, um, we currently are conducting a big study in our center, sponsored by the Agency for Health Research and Quality, um, called the Empower Study. And the Empower Study we got funded by agency to improve on the diagnosis and treatment of urinary incontinence in the primary care setting. And we had created a multi-level intervention. Core to that intervention was educating primary care physicians about the management of urinary incontinence. So we have what we call uh, uh, uh, master classes. And these master classes are eight sessions where we're talking about evaluation, treatment, physical therapy, medication, surgical. And the uptake, the, the amount of physicians who are signing up for these sessions that we have for free for them, and we provide them lunch, is not as we expect it to be. And the problem we have in the United States, I don't know if it's the same here in Turkey, is that 
they, these primary care physicians are so stressed to deal with multiple things with limited amount of time that when the patient reach out to them with an issue of bladder dysfunction or incontinence or nocturia, they unfortunately, a lot of them ignore the problem or just set it to the side. So, but we continue to educate it on us to keep the education and actually we're trying as a group based on this Empower study to go to the family physician uh, meetings and create these uh, master classes in the United States. So we're hopeful that we, this, we, we can move this forward in the future. Aslında ben biraz da aile bireylerinin eğitim aslında ben biraz da aile bireyi eğitimi konusunda soruyu sormuştum yani primary care physician dışında. Oh, I, I, I, I. Uh, do we do you advocate the family uh, caregivers? Um, typically, if the patient definitely comes with a uh, primary uh, provide like caregiver, like a daughter or a uh, or a son or a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law, we we definitely engage them in this education about what is the impact of management uh, with behavioral therapy, especially because these are partners. Uh, they help us enforce these changes that we want. Uh, just a, a short comment about education and uh, uh, nocturia. I think it should start uh, in the universities, in faculties of medicine, uh, because uh, uh, surprisingly, the only time our students in our faculty hear about nocturia is in urology and is just a short class. And uh, uh, nocturia is obviously uh, something much more important uh, in terms of uh, uh, the multiple diagnoses that can be behind nocturia. So education in students is also critical. I 100% agree with you. And as I said, the survey has demonstrated that. They immediately, th when you ask primary care physicians or family physician about nocturia, they think it's a urological condition. For us, who are the experts in this room, we think as the majority of it is medical conditions, with little of that being urological. Çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Zaman ayırdıkları için hocalarımıza çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Salondan başka soru veya katkı yoksa podyumu bundan sonraki sempozyum için Ali Ergen hocamla Kürtel Zengin ve Tufan hocalarıma bırakıyoruz. Tekrar çok teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you.